welcome Dr. Sundar Kataria to virtually inaugurate the session. Please join us for the recitation of Gayatri Mantra. Introduction of the keynote speaker. A brief introduction of our keynote speaker, Mr. Dr. Santosh Dattar. Uh, he is occupational health physician. His academic qualification is MBBS. He is diploma in anesthesiology, industrial medicine, hospital administration. He is a postgraduate diploma in medical legal system. He has done his NABH accessory courses. His area of specialization is trained in occupational health, hospital administration, and medical legal issues. He is a lead auditor for ISO 9001 and BSOHSAS 18001. He has overall 35 years of experience in occupational health and industrial hygiene. Please welcome. Mr. Dr. Santosh Datta, over to you, sir. The screen, <clears throat> screen visible? Yeah. Yes, sir. Yeah. Uh, uh, thanks for the kind introduction and the invitation. Uh, it will be a pleasure to speak to all of you. <clears throat> Today, I will be covering a brief of occupational health and industrial hygiene. Now, both these topics are uh, big topics. And uh, I will try to give an overview in this uh, one hour and five minutes, and then followed by question and answers. <clears throat> Now, occupational health is a little different specialty from a, a regular specialty, you know, uh, that uh, uh, we occupational physicians, we basically after MBBS, uh, we undergo a course called AFI, that is Associate Fellow in Industrial Health or Diploma in Industrial Medicine, as, as the case may be. So what is occupational health? Now, all of you know about the definition of health. That is, health is a complete state of physical, mental, social well-being and not merely absence of the disease. This is a WHO definition. So, taking a cue from this, uh, we can define occupational health as promotion of and maintenance of highest degree of physical, mental, 
and social well-being of employees in all occupation at all location now these two words are very important in all occupations okay that means right from the uh, chief executive officer to the you know mali working on the in the garden in the horticultural garden there okay and at all location so it could be each and every location and even outside the factory also because bhopal gas trade is a glaring example and many times during the audit uh, we get the answer no uh, uh, this person is a contractor employee no once the person is inside your premises uh, uh, it is a responsibility of the principal employer to look after her or his health now when you go to doctor and suppose you have fever the doctor may ask a lot of question when did fever start how much was the fever are there any associated symptoms so this person this doctor he asked a very important question to the uh, patient what is your occupation and he tried to in that you know in century he tried to correlate the occupation to the uh, the patient's illness so that's why this is called dr bernardini ramazani and he is also aptly called the father of occupational health and he has written several books also uh, which can be considered as a treatise itself so he is a father of occupational health dr bernardino damasini now uh, one english surgeon and one of the founders of orthopedics sir percival pod uh, when he was practicing he noticed that he is seeing a lot of cases of cancer of the scrotum uh, and when he went in their occupation uh, he found out that they are they are all chimney sweepers now as you know abroad Uh, that time there was no heaters available so every house has to have a chimney and when you burn charcoal or wood uh, the soot will collect inside you know and then there was a trade called chimney sweepers they will go inside it and clean it and after years of exposure uh, they will develop this cancer of the scrotum so uh, sir percival pot uh, made this brilliant observation and uh, in fact one of the occupational diseases identified is was a occupational cancer so and from that day onwards you know uh, many people started uh, looking for the correlation between the occupation and the uh, the disease pattern the patient is exhibiting now how this obnoxious uh, chemicals enter in our body i am going go to the hazards later on so the biggest is inhalation it's a commonest route of entry and a very large surface area because as you know if you remember your anatomy uh about the last uh, point in our lungs is the alveoli and there are millions and millions of alveoli with exchange uh oxygen and co2 oxygen is taken in co2 is thrown out and the same way not only chemicals the microorganism also can enter to in our body and uh, the covid-19 virus is a very glaring example so chemical may stay in the lungs if it is a dust or absorbed in the blood and it may cause a systemic effects the next is ingestion please remember our seven standard hygiene wash your hands so and there is a dictum that don't uh, eat where you work uh, this is for that simple reason so poor hand hygiene and wash hands failure to use suitable gloves contaminated food and water the germs can enter skin absorption it can be absorbed to the skin any cuts and damage will increase the absorption and uh, if there is a acid alkali or corrosive corrosive it can cause a direct injury so these are the main routes of entry what are this uh, effects now there could be a short term effects due to exposure to high concentration effects depend on the toxicity of the chemicals so acute effects so if there is a very high concentration it may lead to suffocation hydrogen sulfide carbon monoxide and hcl that is hydrogen cyanide now these agents cause asphyxiation at a cellular level that means they deprive the cells of oxygen because they interact with the chemicals there and uh, they don't allow the oxygens to utilize as you all know our oxygens utilize sugar and uh, oxygen burn and produce calories so it is it occurs at the cellular level so when i was working in oigc the uh, one of the gases which uh, uh, was a component of the natural gas was h2s and the danger of h2s is at high concentration it's uh, numbs your sense of smell so we are all taught to put on the scba that is self contained breathing apparatus as long as within the time like 27 37 as long as we can hold our breath carbon monoxide all of you know cyanide is a very potent poison all of us know and it could be irritant gases <coughs> like chlorine ammonia or sulfide oxide they will irritate the lungs and produce a lot of fluids 
and the person may have you know uh, breathing difficulties poisoning by arsenic at high levels or long term effects now these long term effects come after a very very long time of exposure slow absorption and it can practically affect any organ of the body so brain lungs heart liver kidney blood bones and each chemical has a affinity for a particular organ for example mercury will affect brain peripheral nerves cadmium will affect bones and kidneys and so on and so forth now they also will cause some they may cause a physical damage and they also may cause a functional damage so i am coming to this what is reproductive so reproductive system can be get get affected there could be a behavioral damage also okay and like organic solvents and manganese they can cause a uh, behavioral damage carcinogenicity is all well known uh, we just discuss about the uh, cancer scrotum the suit as best known benzene vinyl chloride mutagenicity that is damage to the genes so radioactive substances or teratogenicity damage to the growing fetus for example the radioactive sub substances and other chemicals now let us come to the occupational diseases because these occupational diseases arise out of the this occupational uh, hazard exposure so what is the gloomy side okay now the gloomy side is there is no man without occupation everybody has to uh, earn his bread and butter at least the bread is not the butter no occupation without hazards no nobody can say i want i want to know work in a area where there are no hazards it, it doesn't happen every occupation as a hazard right from the person working in a mine in a factory or the cobbler sitting on the road or a, a person working in the office itself only office environment everybody has some or other hazard associated with his, his or her uh, occupation and <clears throat> the gloomy side is there is no treatment for most of the occupational diseases so once the damage has occurred i mean it's very 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 difficult to uh, treat that disease and that's why prevention is very 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 important but what is the gloomy side positive side <clears throat> most are 100% preventable the causative factors are known identifiable measurable and controllable so at your workplace you know what are the hazards uh, how much the person is exposed so everything is known identifiable measurable and controllable and in spite of that if we still don't control it then then uh, then, 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 then it, it is not totally acceptable now population at risk is known like suppose you ask me to control malaria now malaria is all over india all over the world i mean very difficult to control but in your workplace you you know who are the people entering your premises how long they are working there so you can supervise them you can control them okay environmental boundaries are also very defined controllable okay and suppose there is a chemical leak uh, you know this chemical leak can travel up to this particular kilometers so not only inside the factory outside the workplace also and early diagnosis is possible because of the long latency period that means that it takes uh, years and years of for the occupational diseases to develop unless of course the uh, chemical is in a very high concentration so that is the advantage so let us look at the positive side also that it is a totally a preventable condition now what are the characteristic of occupational disease they take a long time to develop there are no symptoms initially suppose a person is working in a noisy area i mean uh, he or she is going deaf but it doesn't realize okay because uh, if you see the uh, sound level you no know, we are able to hear from 20 to 20000 hertz and our speech range is in 250 to 2500 hertz and in a noise induced hearing loss the higher frequencies are affected first the lower frequencies like the speech is not affected earlier so the person doesn't realize because he is able to converse with people he or she doesn't realize that they are going uh, deaf so no symptoms initially most are not curable we have discussed this most are preventable we have discussed this and sometimes it is very difficult to establish a cause you know, that is it because of the occupation it is happening because suppose there are many cancer they may occur in a person who is non exposed also so it, it is very sometimes difficult to establish a cause and unless you are able to you know establish that yes 
he uh, he has uh, been exposed to at workplace then only we can make a definitive diagnosis so these are some of the occupational diseases like pneumoconiosis pneumo is lung coniosis is the affection this is the affection due to uh, lung affection due to the dust like asbestos uh, the coal dust uh, the cotton dust okay and the silicas the silicosis is very common in india occupational asthma occupational dermatitis dermatitis means the infection of inflammation of the skin so the skin is exposed it gets inflamed noise induced hearing loss we have discussed this liver and kidney and many organs toxicity nervous system disorders okay so there are many occupational diseases there are 29 occupational diseases listed under the <coughs> uh, schedule 3 uh, of the uh, schedule 3 of the factory act okay 29 notifiable diseases so let us ha have a look at the workplace hazards now all of you know what is a hazard <coughs> it is a source of danger okay so there could be physical hazards there could be chemical hazards there could be biological hazards ergonomic hazards mechanical hazards and psychosocial hazards okay so there could be these different types of hazards a person may face now let us have a look at the briefly have a look at each hazard like heat now the heat wave is starting in india already the temperatures are soaring and we are sweating so heat may cause if it directly applied to the skin it may cause burns burns okay it may cause heat exhaustion because what happens your 70% body is made of water so when you are exposed to heat you sweat not only you use water you use salts also so when the level of the water comes down you know then uh, you feel getting exhausted and when you lose soil you will get what is called a heat cramps and you will get a increased fatigue also so heat stroke it's it's a very um, dire medical emergency you know there is a thermostat in the brain which controls the our temperature all of you know it uh, so but this thermostat fails at a higher temperature when the person is exposed to heat for a long time and the temperature keeps on rising and unless treated it's a fatal disease so this is very important and a simple solution to that is keep on drinking water of course there are many other ingredient controls but keep on drinking water and a simple trick is a look at your urine if your urine is dark that means you are not drinking enough water you you know it should be light colored there are uh, if you go to the uh, go to the net this urine charts are available you can download and uh, use them now i am not going in the controls because it will take a lot of time i will co cover controls in general in the later on cold like trench foot frost bite hypo is low thermia is uh, temperature so below 35 degrees we say mild hypothermia below 32 uh, severe hypothermia and frost bite is because of the localized cutting of blood supply like fingers toes or the tip of the nose because when happens when you are exposed to cold for a long time you know your blood vessels contract and cut off the blood supply and you no know, if not treated in time a gangrene may develop now light illumination is very important so insufficient light will also cause problems excessive light will also cause problems so both will cause a lot of uh, eye strain headaches uh, it may cause accidents also so ensure proper illumination and there are illumination guidelines available in the national building code or in the factory acts and on the relevant acts no noise there are something to call auditory effects a temporary hearing loss suppose you are exposed to a noise for a, at a higher level then you are exposed to a uh, uh, i mean you you can't hear for some time because your ear cell try to shut down try to repair themselves and permanent hearing loss that is nihl it is a notifiable disease under factory act noise induced hearing loss and it comes slowly and once damage occurs it's it is very permanent okay so but what is also important is non auditory effects imagine you are exposed to a very loud noise continuously for 5 or 6 hours i mean it is akin to a stress response those who under undergone stress management lectures will know that you no know, when you are uh, exposed to say there are harmful chemicals released in the body so nervousness fatigue interface with communications sleeplessness and many many effects will occur it will lead to accidents also so non auditory effects of noise vibration 
there are two types of vibration the whole body vibration and the uh, localized vibration so drillers air animals pile drivers excavators earth wind equipment so people uh, person sitting in this chamber you know is continuous to his whole body is exposed to vibration so it could cause a musculoskeletal problems or joint problems and there are localized vibrations uh, you must have seen on the road the person drilling with this hand so what happens after years of exposure when the person start using this you know is the blood vessel going spasm and the person the fingers become white now that mainly happens in a cold climate not as much as in a temperate climate as in india but it will happen in a cold climate it can also cause injury to joints and cell go and aggravated by cold contact so this is uh, uh, due to a localized vibration here his whole body is not exposed but his fingers and hands are exposed non ionizing radiation due to sunlight wedding light it can got arc eyes what is called uh, the, those who are having wedding at their uh, workplace they will know that due to expose the eyes will you know start uh, burning uh, they will become red it's a self limiting condition and many times the welder will not get arc eye because he is a trained person he will use the eye protection the people working around will get that it can lead to cataracts skin cancer and premature skin aging due to the non ionizing radiation non ionizing radiation people are little afraid of this but believe me the air travel and the ionizing uh, the nuclear plants one of the safest because there are so many controls in place of course when a problem occurs it's a disaster but otherwise uh, is one of the safest uh, uh, workplace because there are so many controls put in place so it could be a nuclear plants it could be industrial radiography it could be radiology and radiotherapy in the healthcare setup so so what ionizing radiation ca can cause at a high, very high exposure sudden exposure it is called ulceration and maybe death but it may damage the gene if the woman is exposed when she is pregnant it will cause uh, malformations in the growing child it will cause cancer and leukemia is a type of blood cancer so these are the effects of ionizing radiation now attitude the higher altitude as well as the sea tip both are problematic at high altitude what happens there is a thin air so partial pressure of oxygen drops and lack of oxygen uh, so it may cause acute mountain sickness high altitude pulmonary edema pulmonary edema means, means your lungs start uh, filling with the fluids and cerebral edema means your brain starts uh, Uh, filling with fluid and both are very dangerous and the on only treatment is come down immediately so those who are uh, used to tracking they will know what i am talking about that you are never taken to a high altitude suddenly no they take you in stages up to 5000 feet then 8000 then 10000 then 12000 because your body must get used to that uh, decreasing level of the of partial pressure of oxygen and that is called acclimatization so that's a very very important the same uh, reverse thing happens when you uh, go go down the sea so like so for divers there is a high atmospheric pressure when they go down there is a whole column of water above them and it will cause a high atmospheric pressure so it will cause a barometric trauma decompression sickness that will what happens your nitrogen at high pressure dissolves and if you come up suddenly then what happen the nitrogen gets converted into gas air and it will go and block the blood vessels everywhere and it will cause problems like you know it will cause stroke and uh, other things osteonecrosis osteo is bone necrosis is the death so some of the high bones you know are very uh, long and big bones may get affected let us come to the now chemical as all of you know there are more than 90000 chemicals used in use but we know uh, side effects of very few of them so a chemical can exist in different forms it could be a dust could be a liquid could be a gas could be a powder vapors mist and all those things okay so chemical can exist in any form so again the routes of entry we are saying the common is inhalation ingestion and skin absorption now a chemical can as a local action also like cement solvents so this is what is called as a contact dermatitis so what is a contact dermatitis that mean inflammation of the skin at the point of contact now many people get this allergic reaction when they wear a ring or a bindi at that side only it will get 
Okay, so that is what is called as a contact dermatitis. But everyone will not get it. So it's about 10 people are using this. Only one person may get it because he has got an allergic tendency. It may get absorbed to the skin also. We have discussed this. Now the size of the dust. Now this is a very big dust. It doesn't mean that it is harmful because a body has a defense mechanism to dust, you know. And the first defense mechanism is your uh, nos uh, your hair in the no your nostrils. They block that dust. That's why you must clean your nose regularly. Second in uh, a tortuous nasal passage, you know. When this dust goes in your lungs, it doesn't follow a straight path. It goes to the nose, then the pharynx. So there, a lot of dust gets trapped. Then uh, the nature, the God has given us a wonderful mechanism. That is the moisture in our nose and pharynx. So as you know, the moisture will also trap the dust. Then if it goes still inside, then what will happen? There are something called a cilia in our uh, tracheobronchial tree. They try to throw away the dust. They move in only in one direction, that is upwards. If still it reaches the lungs, there are some uh, no, uh, killer cells. What will they? They will try to engulf this dust and remove it. But of course, there is a limit to body defenses. And when the amount of dust deposited in the lungs overwhelms the body defenses, then the problems start occurring. So you can, you can see here, airborne dust. So, so this is called respiratory dust because it goes inside. Okay. So we'll not go in details of this, but just for example. Now gases and fumes. In our workplace, there are many such uh, occasions where the person may inhale, like wedding fume solvents, cutting oil weeds, spray paint, solvent vapors, asbestos, lead, silica, cadmium. So practically, uh, at workplace, uh, any chemical can get inhaled or you know can get absorbed to the screen or ingested if your uh, personal hygiene is not good. So gases may cause a severe lung irritation. We have discussed that asphyxia. We have discussed that lung cancer asbestos and all that, and occupational asthma, okay? Occupational nickel, uh, chromium. So occupational asthma means the person, uh, suppose he, is, uh, he has taken leave for seven days. Now next Monday he goes to the factory and he inhales that chemical. Then what happens? He gets an asthmatic attack. The bronchials will narrow and he will start wheezing. You know, he'll get asthmatic attack. But once he is out, it will stop. So this is occupational asthma because it is triggered by the presence of the chemical. Now it won't happen to everyone. It will happen to a particular person because he has a tendency for that. Injection, we have discussed this again, various chemicals and microbes. No, biological hazards, exposure to microbes, bacteria, fungi, viruses, molds. Molds is again one type of fungi. They can be ingested, they can enter through broken skin and they can be inhaled also. So who are the people who are most commonly exposed? Of course, all healthcare workers, people in the working with the sewage, sanitation, in the uh, people working in the labs with the animals, animal husbandry, uh, veterinary surgeons, okay. So, and very important at workplace, which I will tell you, is that the canteen audit, your cafeteria audit. In many places, you know, the cafeteria audit is not done as seriously. Because at one place, I said, no, the cafeteria, no, they are not workers. I said, your people are eating there, right? It is in your premises. So if something happens, a food poisoning occurs, you are responsible. So you cannot get away with this. So canteen audit, a cafeteria audit is also very, very important. That is people are following all, I, I can talk on the cafeteria audit for one hour, but you can just uh, Google it and uh, there are a lot of uh, data is available, how to do this audit. Whether the people are washing their hands properly, uh, whether they the food handlers undergo a regular checkup or not. So this is all things are very important. So please remember this, a takeaway from this, that your canteen and cafeteria audits are very important. Now, when your body is sick, you go to the doctor. How many people go to the doctor when your mind is sick? Okay. So, the failure to adapt, lack of job satisfaction, low wages. Now, everybody, low wages is a common problem. Everybody from the top boss to the uh, lowest category will say they are not getting enough. So, it's a very common problem. 
because nobody is happy. Uh, most of the people are not happy at the wages they are getting. Poor interpersonal interactions and deprivation of family life. Now there are many, there are many, many uh, reasons, and from your own experience, you can call that. But the psychosocial uh, uh, hazard is uh, recognized hazard, and it is very, very important. So it will cause stress, addiction, sexually transmitted diseases, especially in a migrant population and malnutrition. Now, uh, here let me caution you about these addictions. Many people say, because I am stressed, I drink. No. it's uh, I mean, it's not correct. They drink because they want to drink. They smoke because they want to speak. Stress has nothing to do with it. It's just an excuse. Uh, you remember a Puran, uh, one old Hindi song. I'm not a good singer, so I'm not going to sing it. But I'll just tell you, Pine wale ko pine ka bahana chahiye. A person who is drinking just uh, uh, wants a reason to drink. So, uh, you give the alcoholic one reason not to drink. He will give you 10 reasons why he is drinking. Okay. So, all the managers and supervisors must be trained at workplace to identify these psychosocial problems, especially addictions, alcohol addiction is very, very common. And what are the telltale signs? The person, you know, starts taking a lot of leave. Then he will start demanding money. He will tell you, my child is six, I want money. Of course, he is not, not going to. The moment you give him money, he will go to the nearest bar. Or, you know, he may, uh, he may produce some sickness certificates or uh, uh, he may be uh, smelling of alcohol. So, these are all telltale signs. So, you pick up the person early and refer for counseling and treatment because uh, after uh, the person is completely addicted, it's very, very difficult to treat him. So, this is one aspect I want to highlight that all supervisors and managers, the person is uh, getting depressed. No, he's not talking to anybody. I mean, he's not following any uh, uh, safety rules. He sits at one corner. So he doesn't talk to anybody. Uh, his clothes are shabby. He's not shaving. These are all telltale signs that person has some mental problem. And you should refer to your doctor or uh, nearest hospital immediately. Now, accident is a domain of the safety people. So I'm not going to, uh, I'm not going to cover this, but I, all, all of you know uh, what can happen during accidents, what kind of injuries. Now ergonomic is one of my favorite uh, topics. I can talk for two hours on this, but I'll just tell you about the ergonomic hazards like manual handling, heavy, frequent and awkward lifting, repetitive task, awkward posture, using excessive force or exertion, and all of you are using computers. So 90, 95% people do not know how to use computers. Even the IT people, they are never taught in there. I've taken sessions for IT people also. Uh, and if you see their workstations, the so-called computer workstation, the person has no idea how to design a workstation. A simple thing is a mouse is on the table. The mouse must be next to the keyboard. Okay. So that your you know elbows are in at a right angle. So there are many things we can discuss, but for the lack of time, this is very important that you go to uh, any website and learn computer ergonomics. It's very, very important because you're sitting there in front of the computer for eight hours, nine hours, and it can, it can cause stagnant, it can cause joint problems. So ergonomics can cause backache, body ache, joint problems, strain, strain and fatigue, and also a lot of psychosocial issues. Uh, because there are a lot of deadlines to beat. You know? So a simple solution is that every half an hour you just get up. Get up from that computer. Go, go, to, the, no, go to the washroom. Go and have uh, food. Go and have water. So it's a relief. Really, really. So I was auditing one of the uh, company uh, manufacturing mobile phones. You know? So there was an assembly. So there was an assembly line was going on. And the person... Uh, the, all the uh, components were kept at a side. So what that uh, lady employee used to do, he, he, she will turn her full spine, pick up a component and then fit it. So I just pointed out to the supervisor there that why she has to turn, this is not a healthy ergonomic uh, practice. I didn't tell him the solution. He himself, what he did, he just shifted the uh, table, I mean components and brought it near her. So of course the problem was not 100% solved but at least 90% solved. No, she doesn't have to turn fully. Okay. So make people aware of these issues, ergonomic problems, and they themselves will solve uh, the problem. It requires a lot of common sense also. 
now we are discuss all these hazards so how to prevent that now first is the knowledge very important all managers and supervisor must be trained for occupational training okay what are the hazards and uh, uh, what can be done to prevent those hazards no identification of specific hazards at your workplace now all these hazards i have enlisted are not necessarily present at your place so you must know what are the hazards at your place and action okay so you have to take action and attitude attitude of the management workers union government law enforcement agencies so basically when the salary negotiations happens you know many people talk of the increase in salary increase in the bonus and all those thing facilities but how many people the unions talk about the safety issues you know uh, earlier you know there is to us to be allowed hazard allowance that is very very comic thing i found what is hazard allowance that you you allowance to the person so the management is happy because uh, it is economical the worker is happy because he is getting the money in hand the union is happy because they are given some benefit to the worker and the hazard is added so this hazard alone business should be totally removed and the aim should be to remove the eliminate the hazard the remove the hazard government and law enforcement so sir if you take a penal attitude that okay i will put you jail i will you know punish you and or not then people will try to hide the things but if you make it a very open the more you report you know more reward you get like all of you know you are people are encouraged to report near miss so even if you have made a mistake you report it so near miss means all of you know what is near miss that means a problem has occurred a deviation has occurred uh, but there is no uh, damage to property or uh, health so near miss are very important so that you can take action and uh, future accidents can be prevented so the uh, unless the attitude is there the whole thing will not you know and is a uh, to be very frank this whole the occupational health in a factory is limited to periodic checkups okay do a periodic check up get that form 7 or whatever it's uh, this thing and everybody is happy so that's not occupational health that is just a part of occupational health now i always say that the prevention of occupational diseases in hands of the engineers and not doctors we come in the picture very late when the damage has already started occurring or disease has already occurred so why engineers are important and design engineers are the gods because when you design a workplace when you design a process okay is very important that you take in consideration all the possible hazards and then you design your factory or workplace in a such a way that there will be a very minimal exposure so that's why the newly constructed factories are very very uh, much more safe than the old factories because Uh, in the construction of a new factory all these factors are taken into account your safe procedure all standard sop safe procedures are there risk evaluation is extremely important uh, i'll come to that later on application of ergonomic principles suppose you are designing a machine you see that all the controls the controls which the person has to frequently operate are at their comfort level you know so that he doesn't have to bend or he doesn't have to reach out to operate a particular control general ventilation because ventilation is very important it will dissipate heat it will take away uh, the harmful chemicals lighting we discussed this repair and maintenance of equipment i need not uh, uh, explain this importance to you all of you know it environmental sanitation that is you keep the environment healthy do not pollute it your waste disposal is extremely important and control of hazard at source what means suppose there is a fumes coming from a process so you put a exhaust fan or you isolate you when while you designing a factory you isolate a process which is hazardous so not many people are exposed to it or you know you put some barriers there so that the what are hazards are there they are not propagated throughout the uh, shop floor so there are many such uh, controls are available so it is a primary engineer's job at a safety person job so it should be a joint decision the doctor the engineer and the safety person and the operation people and many times you when you purchase a system the manufacturer itself will give you all the occupational hazards the process flow 
and the safety uh, controls and all that. Now you have designed a nice factory, but administrative measures are lacking. That it is of new use. So you should have washing facilities. You tell the person to wash hands, but the washing facility is 20 minutes away. So he is not going to do it. Safe drinking water, very, very important. So you check your water for potability and on the water cooler, you paste that. This water has been tested on this date. The next testing date is this. So it gives a confidence to the person who is drinking water. Nutritious food. Now, nutrition doesn't mean, you know, very high, uh, this thing. Nutrition is basic, simple. Our Indian food, our dal, chapati, rice, vegetable, salads, fruits is an excellent food. But no sweets. No sweets. Do not give sweets after, because you are adding extra calories. The sugar is one of the most dangerous uh, food item. It adds extra calories. And you know what happens when you add extra calories, overweight and all these lifestyle diseases. Fruits need not be given after food. Fruits can be given in between, you know, because when you are taking a wholesome meal, you don't need to give fruits and sweets after the meal itself. But PP is personal protective equipment, statistical monitoring, research. Now, this is very important. Grievance redressal mechanism. I have a mental issue. I am grieved. So, I should be able to talk to somebody, not necessarily the boss. I should be able to. So, Many uh, progressive organizations have the consulate facilities on board, okay? Or some mentor. Your boss is not your mentor. There's some other person who is your mentor. He, he, will, he or she will groom you for a greater, uh, higher role. Good housekeeping. I need not explain the importance from safety point of view. Training is extremely important. Workless cycle. What is workless cycle? That is, suppose a person is uh, uh, working near a boiler, you know, in a hot... Uh, uh, furnace. So suppose he, there are guidelines available. He works for half, say one hour, then he goes and works somewhere else or he takes rest. So he's not continuously exposed to that environment. So this is called a workplace cycle. Safety audits, I need not emphasize the importance of this. Family planning. Why family planning? Because a healthy family, a small family is a healthy family, a healthy family, the person will be more productive. Because it is said that the people will bring their problems from home to work and work to home. Best disposal, we have discussed this. It's a very important. So these are administrative measures uh, uh, should be in place. Promotion of general health of workers. The person is more fit, is more likely to withstand the occupational uh, hazards. So nutrition, hygiene, sanitation, immunization, mental health, health education. So conduct a lot of health education programs and family planning. The, no, no, the uh, toolbox talks and all that. Now, medical measures is the job of a doctor. So, pre employment, periodic, biological monitoring. You can just read it. I'm not going to read from the slides. Documentation addition, health education, counseling. So, let us a uh, few words about the medical surveillance. Now, it's not a general checkup. Like you go to this health uh, clean, you get a silver checkup, a gold checkup, and platinum checkup. No. Even you should not go under the, all these checkups there. You talk to your doctor to what you need and then only undergo. They don't, uh, just because you are getting, you know, some, some people advertise within 700 do this checkup, which is not really needed for you. Okay. And sometimes it can cause confusion. So medical surgery need not general checkups. Criteria and test should match optimal risk exposure. I had gone to a factory, they were doing uh, uh, audiometry for everybody. I said, how many people if are affected are exposed? No, only two. Then why are you doing for 100 people? Unless you are uh, uh, wasting time, wasting uh, money also. So, the person who is undergoing a test should match his risk profile. Okay, he is exposed to this risk. Okay, fine. Then he will undergo this test. It should not be all tests should be done for everybody. Will be different from different trades in the organization. You know what is a trade? Like a waiter, uh, electrician, uh, office worker, and so on and so forth. And of course, you consider the legal provisions. There are legal provisions in the Factory Act, the Mines Act, and now the new Labor Code. So you have to take consideration of that. So medical surveillance is of the this type, pre-employment, because you want a fit person for the job. We are not doing charity here. You want a person who is fit for the job, and he he or she also should not cause accident for others. For example, a person working in the overhead crane. 
something happens to me he will be safe there but uh, he will kill 10 people uh, below down okay so that's that's very important and it's uh, when you do a pre employment you have a baseline also periodic medical examination it's done every, once in every year and in hazardous processes once in every 6 months and that, what is very important that you pick up a early disease so the aim of periodic examination is not for prevention but early diagnosis we talked about that pre placement suppose a work person is working at part what particular location now he is shifted because of the job rotation then he may be fit to do, do that to work but is he fit to do this work so he should be evaluated on referral suppose some person develops a symptom and exit so many many industries do exit many corporates or many corporations do also exit medical examination while the person is leaving the organization the second upset a doctor can do is what is called biological monitoring so when you uh, chemicals enter in your body they are metabolized and they are thrown away either as a whole or as a metabolite like so for example alcohol when you drink alcohol it is thrown as it is outside your uh, breath so that's why this you know alcohol testing done by the uh, traffic cops so the commonest sample is urine then the blood the exhaled air and the hair you can read that so urine is a very common use because it is non invasive and it is uh, uh, ease of collection also hair also earlier you know people used to this arsenic poisoning was very common so if there is a doubt people used to exhume the body and test the hair because the this arsenic can remain in the hair for a long time not very common now but uh, earlier if you have uh, read the uh, uh, detectives novels earlier in the older times uh, these things are mentioned there so biological monitoring is a uh, a useful tool but the problem is it is not available for all chemicals so as a part of medical examination you can do this uh, and if it above the safe level i will not say safe level but uh, permissible level then you remove the person from a uh, remove the person from the exposure now this is very important scg similarly exposed group so it could be location wise task wise hazard mapping job safety analysis so for and so forth so let us see this is a uh, factory this is a, a factory location okay so suppose this area is noise this area is heat stress so you should map your factory or workplace this area is you know uh, ergonomic problems now this area is exposed to part this area is exposed to noise also exposed to ergonomic problems also so there may be overlapping so people working in this area will form a scg people working in this area will form another scg because they are exposed to two uh, two hazards so this is the way you do hazard mapping and then uh, then uh, form these scgs now what we do as a doctor trend analysis am i seeing some symptoms very commonly in this particular workshop then uh, alarm bell should go oh there is some problem at this workshop why i am seeing a lot of cup cold cases here or why i am seeing a lot of skin irritation there there must be some problem okay so monitoring any disease patient in similarly exposed zone using non exposure as a control so i measure suppose this uh, uh, incidence of skin problems are very common say 80% in this work group but those who are non exposed is only 2% then i know there is some problem happening okay so this is called a trend analysis now let us come to the uh, our last topic that is industrial hygiene so hygia is a goddess of health cleanliness and sanitation the greek goddess of course in india uh, in indian mythology no ashwini kumars are the gods of health so industrial hygiene is the science of anticipating recognizing evaluating and controlling workplace condition okay now industrial hygienists are science graduates what trained in this okay so i am what i am talking about industrial hygiene will be from the medical point of view and just to go, go give you the overview so you anticipate the hazards you recognize the hazard you evaluate the hazard and you control the hazard so this is a basic uh, definition of a hazard in as per iso 45000 earlier it was 18000 now it has become iso standard source with the potential to cause injury okay now probability is the major of likelihood that event will occur just because hazard is there doesn't mean the person will get affected 
So risk is effect of uncertainty. Risk is often expressed in terms of combination of the consequences of an event. So that's why what we say, risk is hazard into probability. Suppose you consider Mumbai, a snowfall. So there'll be a very uh, possible hazard, but probability of occurring in Mumbai is zero. So there is no risk. Okay. Like I had gone to a I had gone to a auditor dental clinic, and the consultant has written then no a noise uh, the noise of the slippers. I said, is this a hazard? How can the noise of the slipper be a hazard? It's hardly very few disciples. But just to complete the thing, he has written. So you should not unnecessarily also identify the risks which are not there, because you will be then spending your resources on that uh, mitigating that risk which does not exist. So what is risk assessment? A person convicted of murder has been given a choice to enter one of these three. Room one is a raging fire. Room two is an assassin with guns. And room three is a pack of hungry lions who are not eaten almost for two months. So which room it should enter? Answer is obvious. Room three, because lions who are not eaten for almost two months will be dead. So when you assess a risk, be practical about it. Don't identify risks which are not there. So these clauses identify in ISO 45,000, uh, address this. Uh, so hazard identification, risk assessment and control is one of the fundamental document of any workplace uh, hazard control. If it is not there, if you don't know what are the hazards and how much is the hazard, how much is the measurement, then you won't be able to control it. And 8.1 talks about the eliminating hazards and reducing OHNS risk. So basically industrial hygiene study attempts to following question, who are exports? Human, animals, ecosystem, when exposure occurs, location. It doesn't occur in every place of the factory. How exposure occurs? Roots, we have discussed this. When exposure occurs, time of the day, in the morning, in the afternoon, how much exposure occurs? So there will this uh, workplace monitoring will come. How long exposure has occurred? Hours per day, week, months, year. Why exposure occurs? Why it has occurred? Why it has occurred in the first place? Is there a problem in your processes? Is there a problem in your equipment? Okay. So failure to use PPEs and all those things. So these are the questions you seek to ask when you are doing an industrial hygiene study. And these industrial hygienists, they come that. Uh, they come and do this uh, study. So material safety data is very important. Now, many times in the audit I found it is not available with the doctor or the user. It is available only with safety. You know, any end user, no, safety and doctor should have all MSDS of all chemicals in the workplace. But user person, the user at end user should have only the uh, MSDS of uh, chemicals which they are using. That's all. He need not have everything. And this should be uh, the prominent hazard should be uh, displayed at those locations. So anticipation is data source. Now data is very great, like the process flow and safety diagram, then the textbooks, then the past incidents, then your uh, you know health surveillance forms, sickness absence data. There are many things. Recognition, hazard identification tool. We can talk for one hour. Measuring instruments tool and control is mitigation measures. So these are the data source. I'm not going to read this. There are many data sources available from where the hazard is anticipated. So illness is in the SCG, we discussed this. So many times, many uh, corporations have this practice of sharing. Suppose there are uh, practices at uh, factories at multiple locations in India or abroad. They share this problem, you know, at our factory, this problem occurred. So, and uh, how this is how we mitigated it. So, you know, the person working, suppose it happens in USA, the person working in India also can read that and assess his uh, workplace situation, whether it can occur to my factory also, and I can take mitigation measures. Now, hazard identification tools, there are HAZOP, HAZAN, ETA, FTA, event tree analysis, uh, fault tree analysis, MOT. This is very important job safety analysis. This is available on the OSHA website. Okay, you can download it and study it. I'm not going to uh, discuss this. Now, measuring the hazards. What can be measured? Okay. There are many things, but I'm just citing very few common things. Heat stress, noise, vibration, air velocity, illumination, 
ionizing radiation, chemical concentration of inert air, indoor air quality, portability testing of water, and use of ergonomic tools. So many, many things, uh, many uh, parameters can be uh, uh, can be measured. So workplace monitoring is a very important tool. There are two types, area and personal. That means you go to a workplace and just measure, take a start reading there. Okay, so you know, oh, this hazard is there. But just because the hazard is there doesn't mean the person is exposed. For example, a, a, a boiler is uh, uh, making a tremendous noise. It is 110 decibels. But once you find out, the operator goes there only in a 10 minutes in a day, just to take make some adjustment or take some readings. So that means the actual risk does not exist. Hazard is there, but the probability is very low. So it can be used to measure a variety of contaminants that are present in the workplace. So it is different from environmental monitoring, you know, uh, which uh, you are supposed to communicate it to the factory inspector, no factory uh, dish that is Department of Industry FFT. There are four uh, uh, at four corners of the factory. There are measuring tools, and they communicate automatically to the uh, dish website. So that, that is not the workplace monitoring. That's just an environmental monitoring. So why occupational hygiene studies? Now many audits I find this concept is lacking. People are, they are environmental department, but they are not doing the hygiene studies. So help in identifying the hazard, assessment of actual risk, so your use of determining tools, assess of different in control, help in identifying fitness criteria and medical examination. So it is also for legal quality and research person. So this is very, very important that suppose somebody say, no, I got affected because of this problem in your factory. You can always show this is my industrial hygiene legend for last 10 years and they are well within the parameters. So greater the dose, greater the effects. This concept led to the development of PL, permissible exposure limits. And first report was published as early in 18. 86. It's a very powerful tool to control exposure exposure. So permissible exposure limits are applicable for airborne contaminants. I'm not going to read this. So now these exposure are not safe limits. Please remember, there is a guideline. Tomorrow, they, with more evidence come, they may, uh, I mean, the limit may go down also from 2 ppm, say it may come to 1 ppm also. Okay, so value should be as low as possible. So it is also called TLV, threshold limit value. But in our factory act, it is called PEL, permissible exposure limits. So what is important for a doctor is time-weighted average consulted for normal eight hours shift, 40 hours uh, a week. So that value is important to me, not the spot value. From this value, I will know whether the person is exposed, uh, really the risk is there or not. Hazard is there. But suppose the limit is set to PPM and he's exposed only to 0.1 PPM. Then I will know that there is not much of a risk involved. Okay, so this reading is very, very important to me as a doctor. Now this I will skip short term exposure limits. Uh, uh, you are allowed to go above the limit only for a short period of time. And this is what is called concentration that should not be exceeded instantly, even for a second also. It could be hazardous. And LRP is as no as reasonably practical, all possible. So these PL values are given in schedule three of the factories. Right? Now, these are different measuring instruments, you know, for the, this is the audio meter, sound level meter, this is for illumination, this is for heat stress. Now, the industrial hygiene is a separate uh, technical subject. So, how to do it and all that, it is their domain. So, they will come to your workplace, they will study your uh, processes, they will study your equipment, and they will define a plan, they will make all these measurements, and they will do a report. And they will uh, suggest you the mitigation measures also. So suppose you are uh, doing eight hour monitoring. Okay, so it should be near the breathing zone. This is called a breathing zone. It should be near over here. And this will keep on collecting that chemical and at down of eight hour shift, you go and analyze it. So these are some other uh, measuring instrument. We are not going in details. There are such certain spot readings are also available. So when the person is going in a confined space, then just insert this probe there and it will give the level of oxygen, the level of CO2, the level of CO, the level of methane, whether it is safe to enter or not. So uh, it's a different science altogether. I'm not uh, going into the details of that. These are algorithmic tools called uh, RULA, Rapid Upper Limb Assessment. And this is REBA, Rapid Entire Body Assessment. It can be done by anybody. 
this looks very complex but once you start using it uh, it is a uh, and the description is available on the net. So this is for ergonomics. And many industrial hygienists also use this tool to uh, measure the ergonomic risks. Now, hierarchy of controls. You have anticipated it, you have recognized it, you have measured it. So many times PP is used as a first control. No, PP is also as the last control. So elimination. I said earlier, the role of the engineer. So you physically remove the hazard is possible. Substitution, replace the hazard. Like earlier, you know, they used to use phosphorus in your mastics and phosphorus is a very dangerous chemical. So they substituted with a lesser hazardous chemical like you know, phosphorus sulfide. So you can either eliminate, you can substitute it. Engineering controls, isolate people from hazard, from control of uh, hazard at source, isolation, barriers, and all that. Administrative controls we are discussed in detail. And last is the PP. Many times it is cited as a, when I uh, when I read the HERA document, it is the only control given the HERA document. And that's not correct. So this is least, PP is least effective because it is person dependent. And as you know, how many people really use PP is very meticulous. And this is the most effective. You eliminate it is the most effective and the effectivity level goes down as you go down this. So let us just consider in a nutshell. So environment monitoring, you evaluate the exposure, biological monitoring, you evaluate the uptake. Biological effect monitoring, that means the chemical has gone inside, but it is damaged the organs, the effect. And disease well-being, how the person is there. So this is a part of exposure assessment. This is a part of health surveillance. I'll give, let us discuss with the example. So what do you take mercury? Not very commonly used now. So you do the environmental monitoring, ambient management, recognize, then you do the personal monitoring. You test the urine mercury, it will give you the exposure. So whether the person has been exposed or not, but has the exposure caused the disease? So you do a serum kinetic sonority, whether kidneys are damaged or other organs are damaged and whether the kidney is damaged or not. So this is a part of the health surveillance. So a efficient combina combination of exposure assessment and health surveillance can mitigate, can uh, prevent this or uh, catch early the diagnostic, this uh, operational diseases. So what is the roadmap for a robust operational health management system? Recognition is a vital tool. You should not uh, see that, you know, if I spend money on that, it's experts. No, it can cause you a lot. It can save you a lot of money. Safety is never the expense, it's an investment. Now, many times in the audits, I find safety is reporting to some operation person, health is reporting to the HR and environment reporting to third person. And these three departments do not work in tandem. They do not uh, you know, work in cohesion, okay, like orchestra. So my recommendation will be preferably safety, health and environment should report to one person, under one, one knowledgeable, uh, responsible, uh, senior, very senior, manager or a director. Because when you integrate the three services, there'll be a better coordination. Otherwise, uh, as you know, people work in isolation. They never bother. As long as their work is done, what happens to the other departments? They don't. So I strongly uh, recommend this integration of these three departments under one roof. Qualified manpower, of course, a proper qualified safety uh, engineer or a qualified doctor, MBBS, AFIH, manpower training, on the job training, the safety training, the soft skills, hazard and risk assessment document. This document is extremely important. It's the mother document to control all the occupational health hazards. This is very important. Legal register. What is legal register? That you make a list of what are the compliances. And then every, I used to do that in my organization. Every, what are pertaining to your department, not everybody. Uh, so every three months, you just keep on ticking. Suppose I have an X-ray machine. Yes, I have the license. I'm using a TLD badge. So keep on ticking. So keep a legal register uh, and you know you are compliant or not. Workplace monitoring, we have discussed this. is extremely important. Medical surveillance, we have discussed this because you are able to catch occupational disease early. OSC upgradation. You convert your OSC in a proper setup. Uh, waiting room. A doctor's room, observation area, if you have a lab or x-ray or whatever it is. 
no this osc there are a lot of guidelines and it should be little away from the factory so something happens you know osc should not first go and maybe inside premises but away from the hazards uh, and easily accessible so let, there are a lot of guidelines available for that regular internal and external audits in my opinion your internal audits are very very important because you know what you are doing okay and external audits are important because it's a very unbiased third party evaluation so these are important so what is the take home uh, message friends employees are exposed to health hazards at workplace occupational diseases are preventable engineering administrative medical and legal measures are for the control of occupational hazards of course in a decreasing uh, uh, efficiency engineering hazards uh, engineering controls are most efficient workplace hygiene studies are crucial for assessing the actual risk exposure controls to be based and effective for the controls uh, for example you find uh, the uh, you find the uh, chemical concentration the air the exposure is say 100 ppm now you put the uh, controls and you remeasure it it comes down to 25 ppm so you know your controls are effective 75% it immediately gives you effectiveness of control just putting the controls is not uh, 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 enough you have to measure the effectiveness of controls and you should have a road map for robust personnel so the safety the money you spend on the safety on the doctor on the occupational health is not a expense it's a investment initial invest initial investment will be high but in the longer term it will give you good returns there will be direct benefits and there will be there are a lot of studies available on this direct benefits indirect benefits and effective audit process can contribute to quality environment and uh, employee health so friends thanks for a patient listening uh, i'll be happy to take uh, any questions i am uh, uh, i am stopping sharing my presentation now over to you manali ji thank you dr santosh datta for the presentation and explaining the topic in simplifying way please put in your questions in the chat box or you can directly unmute yourself and ask the questions Uh, dr datta an amazing presentation and 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 really you know you've covered everything within the presentation in the gamut of uh, industrial hygiene and occupational diseases uh, sir if i i request everyone if there are any questions you can put up the questions in the chat box or alternatively you can raise your hand and ask the question thank you subhit ji yeah yeah superb sir superb you've covered all the gamuts of the and and it's very very in depth sir you've taken us through the entire in depth manali you can stop sharing for a while so we can you know be on screen okay sir yeah just stop sharing perfect so uh, dadar sir by by the time we start getting questions let me let me post something dadar sir what do you think is the actual core issue is it is it awareness amongst people where you know we've seen like most industries they just they just for name sake want to implement you know to find out what are the issues within the organization health checkup bhi karate hain to bada standards hai ek health checkup hai they do not related to their risks associated so you beautifully covered the gamut of risks and what is required and what is your legal you know legal thread bear of the company what is the actual core issue is it is it more towards awareness or are we too laxed when it comes to you know worker health or employee health what is the actual issue in the industry see to my knowledge uh, awareness is not a big issue people are aware what they are doing 
okay but the problem is that uh, i uh, covered it in the attitude you know attitude of everybody management unions uh, workers and uh, government and law enforcement agencies so uh, you have to attitude and many times still the you know the safety measure the uh, doctors the health checkups it seen as a expense so unless you change your mindset uh, this is not going to work and it's always a top down approach unless the top man is convinced it, it is not going to percolate down the future that's what as i said yesterday many times industry uh, they just do the periodic examination get that form 7 uh, stand by a certifying surgeon and everybody is happy no that is not optimal health optimal this is just a small part of optimal health occupational role of a doctor is more in a factory workshop rather than in the clinic so i would say it's 70% preventive 30% uh, curative is not there to, 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 to treat cough and cold so unless the organizations realize it and uh, I, i'm not passing any judgments but mncs are have better concept you know if you see uh, that must be your experience also of all these safety issues sumit ji you are on mute you're absolutely right sir we we we've seen that as a experience that mncs are more aware and you know they kind of uh, put more response to the fact that they analyze what their illnesses are and the doctors the certification being done is more specific to their work related issues sir that that definitely is seen but but how, how much portion do you think it is, you think awareness is uh, available because what we see is a lot of companies when we do the assessments we see a lot of companies actually get the health records done whether they get it stamped or they actually analyze but they do it generic it's always generic it's not specific to their work exactly. and and even the doctors i i i shouldn't say that but even the doctors are just signing off on reports which are there are are being asked they're not actually analyzing what is the work related exactly. Ill, illnesses so it's it's on both sides so so is it because we are so casual that we just need to meet the compliance requirement and put yes. in something see everybody wants to meet the compliance and that's all once you are compliance you are happy then whatever happens uh, you're not bothered so but my opinion is we should go above the see law prescribes what is minimum you should do something much above to add quality so a safety culture and occupational culture in the organization perfect sir, perfect perfect yeah. i i'd invite any more questions from anyone uh, in the audience mukesh chandegar what should be the company policy or contact cell or see uh, to my knowledge anybody except occupier everybody is a worker inside of it am i right sumit ji perfect sir so whether the contractor or the it doesn't matter it is a duty of the principal employer so they must undergo the same check up the same uh, safety measure the same occupational measures as in your permanent employees and suppose you are giving the contractor the responsibility of check medical check ups then the company doctor suppose he identifies one clinic there the company doctor should go there talk to that doctor there when many times this they, these doctors are not aware of the occupational health issues they just do it as a general check up so in my opinion it is the duty of the principal employee perfect sir perfect well said sir uh let me let me now request manish ji or dr kataria dr kataria manish ji or anand ji to you know share their kind of experience and what they have a feeling in this entire scenario yes kataria sir well uh, uh, thank you compliments to dr datta it was very nicely he has covered all aspect of uh, health and safety and industrial hygiene Uh, my uh, great uh, concern is uh, about the awareness among the workers now if you see in india there are a lot of unorganized sectors which yes, comes yes yes and there are people coming from uh, villages for 3 months 6 months they work they don't have any idea which industry they are working what they are doing it just yes. they are doing it and the top man as you are told unless the top man it has to calculate from the top man to down below and so only it can be done so there uh, there is a lot of mismatch first thing awareness then second thing uh, another thing which is uh, our concern is just i am putting a direct question to you agro industries yeah i will just give you an example our phool wala comes in the morning delivers yes. us the yes. flowers yes and suddenly he 
says i am not going to come from bob okay he asked what is the what is the problem he says see my hands because every day i am making the flower mala correct so my hands have become very bad and yeah. doctor told you have to change your uh, uh, this uh, yes. work yes. so ergonomic problem yes this is one example i have given you but there if you go in the, in the agro industries you can find lot and lot of things which are mismatch no actions have been taken by the government or authorities Well, can you put some light on this two uh, aspect yeah. uh, agriculture industry there is, frankly to be uh, i don't have much exposure but what will be the common uh, occupational health problems for occupational it will be all see construction industry and agri industries uh, most of these uh, hazards we discussed the physical hazards are there the chemical the biological the ergonomic the psychosocial and accident so construct in my opinion construction and agro industries most of these hazards will be prevalent and of course uh, again agro industry again the pesticides working in the sun and uh, you know this biological exposure to the germs the injuries right so these are the main hazards uh, they yeah. face some injuries they have of course they'll... psychosocial hazards you know you, you have cultivated a crop and suddenly the uh, suddenly the rain comes it is happening now absolutely i mean what will happen to that person totally devastated absolutely Absolutely. So it's a plus. Plus the 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 problem with the agro industry is one. It is at a at a at a majority level. It is very unorganized and single exactly. man Absolutely. driven. Absolutely. Uh, currently, the scenarios are changing where you know the the big big daddies of the industry are taking on farm areas and you know getting them to work. There's, there's this new concept which has come where a big big company takes on the entire yes, uh, yes. area and then. Uh, gives them certain compensation on monthly basis, and then whatever yield they 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 take the yield on. Yes, Ananji, let's hear it from you yeah. on uh, you know what has been your experience and and in terms of the occupational health. Uh, good morning, everyone, and uh, Santoshi. Uh, first of all, I thanks and uh, appreciate. Uh, I I was attending this uh, session since the beginning. and uh, the moment you were covering i was having certain questions and these questions were uh, again uh, replied in the uh, coming slides so most of things you have uh, very well covered so my questions were uh, being answered in every next slide so it was uh, very well explained only the remaining thing uh, which i wanting to know uh, is how to identify a, a medical officer or a physician or a things by the factory okay. for identifying or for conducting that uh, health checkup because as sumit sir also said uh, same thing that uh, a routine checkup uh, the company is spending money yeah. uh, but they are having a certain uh, one format in which the doctor is put a stamp and sign it yeah, yeah. and yeah. nad 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 and uh, all those things which you have very well covered now it is because the awareness is not there neither with the uh, user or the employer or sometimes uh, the msds one of the beautiful thing which you have said that msds must be there with the uh, doctor also which is a very uh, specific and a very uh, good thing which you have said so how to identify that uh, any medical officer or uh, no. how how an auditor can intervene in this particular process of uh, medical basically uh, for a company having hazardous processes as a schedule one of the factory act correct and the relevant provision the new labor code we are supposed to appoint a doctor uh, who is mbbs and afih that is afih is assured for industrial health this is a three time full time certificate training now there are some exemption given in that so first they have to and the number is also identified up to 200 workers then up to above 500 also so what auditor can do whether they have uh, first is a hazardous industry or not second there are sufficient numbers of doctors or not and third is are they qualified afih okay now the problem in uh, especially in maharashtra you are you are taken a afih doctor but his powers are limited he cannot do medical check up it has to be done by certifying surgeon he cannot even conduct a first aid uh, session because that has again to be uh, Conducted by a doctor. Now, a MBBS doctor working in the factory, if he cannot conduct a first aid session, he is not allowed to conduct. I mean, then what? Do, what do we say? <laughs> so these are the issues he has to be addressed. No, you have to call an outside person. 
Then the company manager will ask, now why am I employing this doctor? He cannot do a checkup. He cannot do a first aid or training. He cannot do this. So only for that sake of it, you know. So if you see uh, this rule 18A, uh, they have Maharashtra government has come with so long back. They said every person should be checked by a certifying surgeon. But rule 73 says, says that every six months, the FMO, that is factory medical also should check. So how many medical surveys in a year? So hmm. these two rules are contradicting and nobody has look, uh, looked at it. You know? So th that is the problem. So unless we give uh, importance to the doctor who is appointed there and give more powers and trust him, if you don't trust the doctor to do a good job, that he will favor the company, I mean, then there is no end to this. Absolutely. But there are, uh, let me tell you, there are not only MNC, there are some top Indian companies, I will not name them, but they are doing a fantastic work in occupational health and safety. I mean, there is no doubt about it. No, it is, it is, it is definitely not a uh, very big task, only yeah. it is uh, just... Uh, you know, convince right the side. lawmakers that uh, you give more powers to the factory medical officer. And it is just uh, to understand and have a correct. knowledge. You have rightly correct. said that knowledge is uh, more important. People are not aware of things. Correct. Once correct. the people are aware, then, then definitely they will be. So it is... Uh, correct. correct. One more thing, uh, which uh, I... Uh, as you said, it is a uh, pre-employee medical checkup, pre-exit medical checkup, and uh, those uh, things. Uh, is it a mandatory or is it a voluntary uh, thing from uh, the organization okay. point of view? So in fact, it is mandatory, especially in hazardous processes, that okay. if you are employing a person, you undergo pre-employment and periodic. But doing a pre-employment checkup is a, uh, a healthy practice even for a non-factory setup. Because, see, you don't want a person... Uh, uh, see, you, when you want a person, you want a person to be fit and productive, okay? Of course, something happens to him two years after employment, you are going to support. That's not an issue. But suppose uh, you're employing a driver and you don't do a vision checkup and he's blind with one eye. What are you going to do? You, you will not know. His eye looks normal from outside. But generally, uh, pre-exit is, is not at all there uh, in the industry. Exit is, uh, in some cases, are there. But generally, it is not there. Exit, exit medical is not there. But as such, you said it is uh, a mandatory as per the FACT Act. No, this is not mandatory. Mm -hmm. As per FACT Act, I don't think it's mandatory. But it's a good practice that when you are living, you are a well and hearty. <laughs> Correct. At least you have the record. So, see that litigation culture is still not come so much in India. But yes. yes. Uh, it is so much yes. there abroad. You know, Sumiji and yes. also you know it. That the occupier has a lot of responsibility, Absolutely. but it is it is actually not worded. It is all embedded. It is okay. and and we yes. at India we are not reading between the lines. We are reading line to line. So that that is where the difference between their understanding. Like for example, Shell has certain high certain level of standards where you know even to change a lamp of a canopy, they get the canopy down and the person doesn't go up. So that that's the level of implementation at major locations. So let me quickly put a question to Yogesh. Yogesh has been doing a lot of assessments within the PSU. So what has been your experience? Do you have you do you feel still feel that it is more generic? Do you feel that the outlook is changing, or uh, what is your take on the entire thing, Yogesh? What do you see implemented on? So from the public uh, public sector point of view, they have. Uh, a corporate policy for conducting the medical exams. They have given the uh, dates or the frequency also. But the thing is, uh, the uh, worker at worker level, they are not uh, that much uh, sincere uh, in conducting the medical. Uh, they conduct the medical exams. They have nominated doctors. They have nominated hospitals. But they are reluctant to get uh, the medical done because of uh, some fear that uh, they may have that uh, because detecting something that may uh, they may lose the job so that uh, that way uh, we find the uh, medical checkups are being done but not for, for all the employees uh, the frequency they are not maintaining and uh, the company they are also not forcing them they can have some administration controls but still uh, that is a gray area where the workers are reluctant to get them uh, examined periodically is there, according to you, is there still the era of stigma being uh, associated with certain types of illnesses yet prevalent in application within metro cities as well? Doctors are, uh, 
Dadar sir, I... no, it was just coming down, not much to it now. I mean, earlier people used to talk about stigmatic disease like tuberculosis, leprosy, HIV. Right. You know, that much is not there. It is but not answering there. to your question, the important tool is identification of SHGs. If you right. want your periodic checkup to be good, then your SHGs should be absolutely uh, on the spot. That form the similarly exposed group and design a... Uh, you will save a lot of money also. Correct. Correct, correct. But but Yogesh, do you see do you see a rational behind you know not checking some checking some or or do you when you I'm sure when you ordered you asked that is there a rational behind this why why are you checking a group like this how have you clustered your group do you find a existent rational behind that I think Yogesh has dropped connection I'd pass that to uh, anyone who can take it either Datar sir or Kadaria sir or Ananji Manish ji would you want to take that Within the health checkup gamut, do you see a rational, as Yogesh said, you know, some people do uh, for some employees, not for some employees. So is it documented? Yeah, do we yeah. see that rational and documentation yeah. in place? See, well, I, think, uh, uh, I will answer that in yes, section sir. 89 of the Factory Act, dangerous occurrences. There, in under certain chemicals, they are identified what is to be done. But otherwise, it's very uh, generic left to the, in the factory rules. Right. So everybody, so that's what I'm saying, that the factory rule should not specify what has to be done. Leave it to the uh, doctor on site. Correct. And for this, SCG is actually show how it should be included. Right. In the that you have a SCG and you show us the corresponding uh, tests. That's all. That should right. suffice. Yeah. Instead of you know doing everything for everybody. Right. 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 Yeah. Kadaria, sir. I have Please. a point here. Please, sir. Basically, if you see from the long time, uh, we have all the implementation before ISO came up and all those things. This is the factory inspectors who were responsible to ensure the health, uh, health and safety and fire safety and all those things are in place. But uh, how, how much they were competent to do? So I have a big question mark on the competence of those people. Uh, similarly, now also we see there are a lot of uh, shortcuts they themselves suggest, oh, you take uh, five people sample, just complete the formalities and complete it. And then uh, they are bribed uh, by the top man. And uh, such uh, malpractices keeps on going on in the industries. Now, how to stop all these things? It's a big question mark. <laughs> But I, I in, in today's era, do, do entrepreneurs or do top management actually go in for such practices? Because you're going to spend X amount of rupees any which ways to meet compliance. So why not spend that X plus 10% and do it right? Because ultimately, it is it reduces the liability for the occupier. Yeah, yeah. So, so yeah. it is in the interest. Plus, plus a happy employee is a more satisfied organization and a more target oriented. See, a lot of multinationals boast about they have a counter at the industry gate of zero hours, man hours loss. You know, they have a counter, accident free yes. counter. And yes. some of them have maintained, you know, three years of an accident free counter. So imagine resetting that to zero. The, the more the counter becomes, the more they get into it. And that's what the continual improvement curve is all about. So we mature. I uh, see it's okay to start shallow. It's okay. I, I believe it's okay to start shallow because that's a point where everybody starts in life. But then the improvement, the maturity, and it comes with awareness. And, and I, I, I think we, whoever has been attending this session has gained a lot from the expertise that Datar sir has put onto paper within the slides and a lot of improvement curve shall take place. With your permission, sir, these, these sessions are recorded and they are, you know, placed on our website for the benefit of industry who wishes to take them so once again sir i would i would thank you if there is a quick question we have time enough for one one question more so if there is any one question yeah uh, sir may i come in please sir please please Nikhil. yeah yeah thank you that are sir you are uh, usually your session are very informative once again the session was very good one thing i want to just uh, highlight here Okay, basically, uh, occupational health safety has improved a lot uh, compared to if you see the decade ago. Yes, of course, ago. of course. There is an improvement. Yes. There is a uh, yes. And now a now lot of service industry has come up. 
So yeah. now manufacturing and service industry, the combination is almost 50-50. Yeah. Yeah. And service industry environment, working environment is quite different to the manufacturing industries. Yeah. Yes. Like, and I feel that a modern lifestyle has given um, one of the things is that stress is yeah. is playing a very havoc. Absolutely. And this is not this is not identifiable easily by your safety officers yes. or yes. Uh, yeah. doctors and all that. Yeah. In yeah. this regards, how how we can improve? Them? Basically, the problems of service industry are different. But the principles are same. Physical, chemical, biological, you apply that. Uh, stress, yes, is an all-pervasive factor every, for everybody nowadays. So, it's, I, as you said, it's very difficult to uh, quantify. Uh, but there are tools available. So, maybe you can employ the services of a... There are a lot of organizations you know, which provide the services. A qualified social counselor, either MA in psychology or MSW. And uh, you know, they can uh, they can come to your uh, workplace and the people can approach them and absolute confidential has to be maintained. And uh, then uh, they can, you know, take some uh, uh, preventive talks also. But what is important is for the top management to convey to all employees that these are the telltale, I'm to, I mean, train the manager supervisor. These are the telltale signs of mental health problems. And uh, convey to the employees, if you have mental health problem, this is the facility available, you go to them your confidence will be mental, your job will not be under danger. Okay. Like my earlier organization, we had a full-fledged, when I was in LNT, we had a full-fledged welfare department and there was no stigma attached. You know, It was a safety culture. Oh, I'm going to welfare department. Fine. Nobody will say, why you have a problem. So that is the culture you have to come in. And there are a lot of counselors and people used to come for their uh, work issue problems or fa family problems. Very, 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 very valid point and very yeah. well said, sir. And in fact, I'd compliment Negi ji to, you know, have bought this out because yes, it's a very absolutely. sensitive thing. But I, I, I'd just like to add a little insight to that. Now this culture is changing and we are coming out of that stigma. Today, all schools have resource rooms. Yes. It's come to that level. So there are hardly any schools which do not have resource rooms. When I, what I mean by resource room is they have a special educator to identify the needs. And here the need identification is done by the teacher. So drawing a similarity within the industry, it is your reporting head who will first come to know that you have certain behavioral issues coming up. It could be stress related. So sensitizing, again, I'm adding the link that Kadaria sir put onto the chat box that training and awareness plays the key vital role. So if you have good training and awareness to be able to identify and Santosh Dada sir said that you add you add a special educator, you get them, you get psychologists, have an assessment of your people. And that's when I think this can be curbed easily because that not only brings down your productivity, it'll, it, it has a bad effect throughout the working culture and atmosphere also. See, it ultimately boils down to work-life balance. Uh, I'll be happy to take a session in future. Uh, whenever you need. <laughs> Look forward, sir. We've got one more session from you. So, Jarna, that's, yeah, that's sure. a good takeaway for you. Work-life balance. And it's, so it's it, something that... He has brought it out very important topic. Sir, it's something that we all need. So, at least I need desperately. <laughs> <laughs> Even Thank I you. also need it. <laughs> Thank you. Absolutely. So, we can all, all, all take that on from you. So, yeah. thank you so much. And, and if, if anyone has a quick wrap-up, a line to make, uh, else we'll, we'll hand over to Manali. Kedaria, sir, any wrap-up line? Ne, uh, Negi ji? Anand ji? Yeah. Sir, what, what the most important thing is basically to... Uh, the intent, I think, is again very important. And the message, the top management of any organization that keeps down the line is again very important from the OHS MS point of view. Because the seriousness depends upon the message that the, uh, it comes from the management. So I think that is what is again very important. Well, well, not well. Said, Manish, sake of certification, not from the sake of certification. Correct, correct. So that comes from Manish Puranik. He is the regional head, uh, and uh, very valid points are very, very, very valid points. I'd, I'd quickly thank everyone and move the session over to Manali. Manali, over to you. Thank you, sir, for the wonderful discussion. Our next session is on 26th March.
Pariyavartan is an annual virtual exhibition and conference organized by ICS. This year, we are going to celebrate Pariyavartan from 2nd to 4th June. Here is our banner of Pariyavartan with the theme Only One Earth. During Pariyavartan, we will be having eminent environmentalists from various industries sharing their views and knowledge about sustainable environment. So do join us during the Pariyavartan. ICS is pleased to provide you all its research and developments, integrated management systems, excellence in educational management, ISO made easy in Gujarati, Marathi, Telugu and Hindi. For reading in any of the above books, please contact Ms. Sushma. Your feedback is of utmost importance. Please register on www.sadgunsang.org and go to your login and give feedback. Thank you for being a part of Sadgun Sam. Dadar sir, amazing session. Thank you thank for you, your thank time. You, sir. Sir. Thank superb, you. superb. Means a lot of learning, sir. A lot of learning. Thank you. Thank you. Amazing. Thank you, sir. Sir, thank you. Uh, sir hey. Shall I log out now? Yes, yes, yes. Thank you so thank much. You. Thank you.